and welcome to Viewpoint. Tonight we've a full 90 minutes as we're in the distinguished company of the Chief Minister. Good evening, Fabian Picardo. Good evening, Jonathan. And of the Leader of the Opposition. Good evening, Daniel Featham. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. These two gentlemen will be asking for your votes next year, but whom do you think should run Gibraltar for the following four years? Well, according to a GBC poll, more than half of us don't know. That don't know who would vote for, of course, if uh, an election were called tomorrow. Just 13 and a half percent said they'd vote GSD. That compares to 33 and a half percent who'd vote for the GSLP Liberals, and 53 percent said that they're still undecided. Tonight, we debate this statistic and we also reveal more poll results, including which issue will be the most important at the next election. First things first, though, a clear majority of those Gibraltarians we did ask don't know uh, whom they'd vote for if an election were to be called tomorrow. So, Mr. Picardo, can I ask you first for your initial thoughts on that statistic? Well, I don't think it's a statistic that I, I think is correct. Um, it's not often that politicians debate opinion polls. Let me tell you, from my point of view, we're here at GBC's invitation. But an opinion poll that puts us ahead doesn't make us too happy, and an opinion poll that puts us behind doesn't make us uh, too worried, because the only opinion poll that counts is the poll carried out on election day by their returning officer in the House of Assembly. Now, you asked me, are 53% of Gibraltarians undecided as to who they would vote? Well, look, I think your own poll tells you that the answer to that is no. Another statistic which you've already revealed suggests well, but, that... But they did tick the undecided well, box. But I'll tell you why. I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment. Another statistic that you revealed showed us that 86% believed that the government was doing very well, well or fairly well. And 70% said the same thing about the opposition. So 86 and 70. In other words, they're telling you what they think about the parties. 53% in a face-to-face -face poll refused to give the final answer face-to-face -face in Gibraltar. I know Gibraltarians. Face-to-face, -face, many of us disclose our political allegiance. You know, there are people who are tribal and there are people who stand up for a particular party. And there are people who don't like to but say... But that's not strictly speaking too insofar as it was a face-to-face -face interview but the paper was handed over for the last question. Uh, it was ticked in whatever way the uh, respondent wanted to, folded and put away. The anecdotal evidence that we have suggests that in some instances actually people were asked who would you vote for and the questioner would tick the box. Perhaps the exception to the rule, but well, the questionnaire itself says very clearly uh, to hand over to the respondent. And so I think that really what has happened here is that people have been uncomfortable in disclosing their view to somebody uh, who is present and who might see what their view is. I don't think 53% are undecided. Look, we know our community is very political. But if it were true that 53% are undecided, well, look, people were very clear as to who they voted for at the last election. If you take out the undecideds, 71% are supporting the GSLP Liberals today and 29% the, the GSD, the statistic almost of the 1992 general election. Look, I'd settle for that result if it was the result of the election morning. Your response to that, Mr. Featham? Well, I bet he's settled for that. Um, look, I agree with Fabian that face-to-face uh, -face polls, I'm not a great fan of face-to-face -face polls because I think that they have a propensity to distort the result. They have a propensity to distort the result actually against the opposition parties. Why? Because opposition supporters are less likely to actually come up in a face-to-face -face poll and say, I am supporting the opposition essentially in a small community like Gibraltar than if, you, than if they were supporters of the government. But this poll is very worrying, and this is why Fabian is very defensive about the poll. It's very worrying for the government because you have 53% of those that are polled that are undecided. Now, that's a remarkable statistic for a government that really is in its, th in its third year, in its first term, that should be on a honeymoon <laughs> period, that 53% of the population are saying, of, of those that were polled, are saying we are still undecided. And you see, elections, if I may, because elections are a, are a judgment on the performance of the government of the day. They're not a judgment on the opposition. They're a judgment on the performance in the same way as opinion polls. Okay, this well, cannot a few be points very there. good for the government. A few points there. Although this was face-to-face, -face, that does mean that anybody who was filling it in in a very comical fashion, yes, you know, uh, I'm going to, you know, fill it in in whatever way, the opposite to what I believe, just for the, uh, for the sake of, of, you know, being funny. 
that's ruled out. I mean, there are advantages to face-to-face -face polling, so I mean, I wouldn't rubbish the methodology altogether. But, uh, but we heard the Chief Minister laughing at your claim there that it's very worrying. Well, let me, the I, I, well, may, I, may I be I allowed you've to both, continue? I think you've both had your say. To explain let's let's why. come back to the Chief Minister now. Well, I just think it's impossible for, for people really at home to, to understand Danny's logic. How is it that a poll that gives me on the morning of the election, if that poll were the election, 71% and gives him 29% worries me and not him? Look, I think it's important that that I say something before we carry on, and it's just a little bit off topic, but I think it is important. Briefly, if you would. Very briefly. Uh, what people are watching tonight on television, what you have organized, actually is actually quite seminal. This is the first time that two political leaders in Gibraltar who are not Joe Bosano and Peter Capuana go head to head. The political torch has passed a generation. We're looking at a poll, but it's also important that people reflect on the fact that politics is moving forward in Gibraltar and that, that Danny's generation and my generation is now representing the generation general public in Gibraltar at the, at the top table of politics. That's equally important to the result, which, look, frankly, Danny, I must tell you, honestly, I'm not worried about the result. Well, look, You're you, may, look you may not be worried. I mean, I have to say that I, that, that I agree. I agree it's important that as the politicians that have, that have taken this torch forward, that we show an example. That's mm -hmm. why we're going to be deb debating it later on, on the question of Spain. I've invited you on many, many occasions to sit down with me to devise a joint strategy of how we take our campaign to Spain. And this is something that is still on the table, and I hope that one day that you will, that you will take that hand of friendship that I have always extended you in relation to that particular issue. But it is a matter, it's got to be a matter of concern, precisely because a, a polls, elections are always going to be a judgment of the government of the day and the performance of the government of the day. And 53% that are undecided after three years of a first-term government in a honeymoon, because usually this is a honeymoon period for a first-term government, it must be very worrying indeed. And the reason for that is because there are significant concerns about employment, there are significant concerns about power supply in Gibraltar, there are significant concerns about the way that you misrepresented the position in relation to the public finances of Gibraltar, in 2011, right. and you continue let's to Let's leave so it up today. there, Mr. Feetum. We'll have plenty Incredible. of opportunity to, to say a lot more on this subject and uh, to challenge each other's points, I'm sure, over the next 90 minutes, live here in GBC. Fabian Pigarda and Danny Feetum go head to head on Viewpoint. You can have your say too. Uh, we'll take emails and calls if they're on topic. Please, I must stress that uh, a little later on. And do use the GBC Viewpoint hashtag if you're commenting on social media. With a general election likely in 2015, which will be the issues at the forefront of voters' minds? Tonight, Viewpoint can reveal that, for you, the Gibraltarian public, relations with Spain and incursions are less important than employment. The location of the new national football stadium is less important than housing. But above all, what Gibraltarians want is to be able to flick the switch and know the lights will come on. The results of GBC's poll indicate that the need for a new power station will be the most important issue for Gibraltarians when they cast their votes at the next election. It's one of the key findings of our opinion poll, commissioned to mark the three-quarter point of the government's mandate. Over five days last week, Colourworks collected 650 questionnaires throughout Gibraltar, equivalent to 3% of the electorate. We asked what the most important issue would be at the next election, and a new power station topped the list, with a quarter of respondents, 25%, stating this was the crucial issue for them. Just today, the GSLP Liberals signed a contract for a new power station. The contract with French company Bougies is said to be worth £77 million. But frustrated citizens who've suffered many power cuts over the past year will point to the fact that not a single brick has been laid yet. Indeed, Dr. Joseph Garcia, the Deputy Chief Minister, conceded in late September on Viewpoint that the new power station will not be ready by the time the next election comes around. The GSD point the finger at the Alliance, saying it shouldn't have cancelled the previous contract they entered into in 2011 for a power station at Windmill Hill. But the Social Democrats were in government for 16 years, and they knew Waterport Station was old and its creaking turbines would soon need replacing. The matter, of course, was compounded further by the dramatic fire in April, just one of the recent examples of the rock experiencing a complete power blackout. Do you accept some of the blame for the power cuts of the last year? 
look, I've been in power for three years, it would be churlish of me to say that I have absolutely no responsibility. Because in those three years, we have done things to ensure that there are no power cuts, and some power cuts have occurred. But if you look at what's happened uh, historically here, and the fact that nothing was done for 16 years whilst the previous administration were in power, and it's not that the minute they were elected they needed to do something, but they received reports that told them that by 2010, water power station would be failing. You know, for them to have chosen the location and the fuel that they chose for the power station they were going to build put this community in a very difficult situation. And therefore, we made the decision not to continue with that contract for good reason. Let me give you an example of just one of the reasons. Today, with diesel at a record low, the cost of diesel at a record low, the cost of one megawatt hour of electricity using diesel is 75 pounds. The cost of one megawatt hour of electricity using liquid natural gas is 40 pounds an hour, with diesel today at a record low. Now, there are many good reasons also to go for gas. It's much less polluting. There is more gas available. It enables you to put the power station somewhere else. The power station location for the GSD would in effect have meant that if you went up the Rock to Jews Gate and you tried to look over the beautiful view across the Straits of Gibraltar, you would see two towers spewing black smoke of diesel. We made the right choice to change the location and to change the fuel type. That meant a delay, but we brought in temporary generators to stop there being a power problem in between. It hasn't been perfect, but people now know that very soon they will have the new power station they deserve with the right fuel in the right location. Was Windmill Hill the wrong location? It was absolutely the right location. And look, in the same way as he accepts responsibility, and I think that he must accept the lion's share of the responsibility, and I'll tell you why in a moment. You know, I accept we were in government for 16 years. Perhaps we could have, could have prioritised it. We could have built a new power station instead of building a new hospital, for with, example. With respect, I think Hang you should know. go further than perhaps. No, 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 no. no. No, and I'll tell you why, no. Because all these reports indicated that we needed to replace the power station by 2010, 2011. In fact, we were working precisely to that timetable. We started with this in 2007. The only reason why the power station wasn't actually built by 2011 was because we were embroiled in litigation and injunctions that prevented us from doing so. But the fact is that as at 2011, the site had been cleared, we had a contract that included not only a new power station, but it also included dual cables. In other words, the improvement, the, up, the, up, the, 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 um, the total renewal of our network system, a new building for, for Jibalek, and also storage facilities. It was ready to go. He took a decision not to go with that power station. Therefore, knowing, in fact, knowing, because of course he says, well, there were these reports, but knowing that the, there were these reports, he took a decision not to go with our contract. And we have a situation that three years into the government's term into office, we've only just signed contracts with the French company for the construction of the... The of same the, company, the, the same company. Half the price. We, well, hang on a minute. I'll, I'll come back to the half the price in a moment. The same company, we've just signed contracts. We are still in the preparatory stages, study stages for the ni liquid natural gas installations, and the land reclamation it hasn't even started, or it's at, in, at its inception. They're going to t they're going to take until 2017, I think, actually probably more likely 2018, to resolve these problems. And all the while, they are building more houses, which is just simply going to increase the demand. At some stage, look. If these power cuts continue, people are going to have to use barbecues to cook their meals, for goodness sake. I mean, you know, this is a, this is a, a, a real problem for Gibraltar. And if the government had, had gone ahead with our contract, it wouldn't be a problem. As for the other problem, as for the other I think matters, we should let Mr. Bigardo come, come back on that. I think, I think it's disgraceful that Danny hasn't addressed the issue of the cost of fuel and what it was that they were landing Gibraltar with, with that particular power station. Even at a record low price for diesel, the cost of producing electricity from gas is almost half. And he's the one who complains about the recurrent expenditure going up. It would have been an albatross round our necks. You see, when you burn diesel, you don't just incur the cost of the diesel, you then also have to pay a fine because you are burning so much carbon. And uh, this year we would have had to pay a considerable fine. In future years we would pay very large fines indeed, in the millions of pounds. So for 30 years running that power station... And will carbon we, emissions be a lot better under gas? Than... Or almost neutralised entirely. But, almost neutralised entirely. Well, but you look, at the, you look at the data and the cost of running the station is less, the cost of the, of the fines will be less. And look, there's absolutely no question and Danny likes to come up with these phrases that he thinks people will remember, that we'll have to cook using barbecues. Well, Gibraltarians quite like 
cooking using barbecues when they want to, not that they should have to. But we have got more than enough power now installed for our community never to have to cook using barbecues, even before the new power station is commissioned. And it won't take until 2018. It'll be done in late 2016, 2017, and it won't be built on the reclamation, as you know, Danny. So but the delay for the reclamation will not be relevant, as you know, because I've told you in Parliament. So look, if you want to continue to make arguments which you know are just untrue because you've had the, the data, well, please do so, but tell people. Well, look, you've shifted your position as to, as to the location of the power station so many times that I really lost track because initially, and there are statements in Parliament from you, you were going to be building this power station in the land reclamation. You, you talk about costs. I talk about health and safety. Look, I, we are not convinced, and Peter Caruan has told you the reasons why he decided to go for diesel rather than gas, uh, when he was considering this particular issue. We are not satisfied about the health and safety issues surrounding gas here in Gibraltar, in densely populated areas. What you are planning to do is to build a power station very near a water port, uh, water port terraces with a liquid natural gas installation. We still don't know exactly where it's going to go, but the government's preferred site is in the t detached mold. I certainly, the jury is still out in relation to the safety so of this. So if you win no, the election, no, no, let me, will, let me you cancel, because, will you cancel uh, the contract? Please pay me the same courtesy that I have paid you. I've asked your question. And let me, let, please pay me the same courtesy. And look, you have refused to, uh, to disclose uh, studies in relation to health and safety. Yes, Not you have. Uh, blast calculations, risk calculations, uh, glass, uh, uh, gas cloud models, all those things that we have asked in Parliament, you have refused, and they are disclosed as a matter of course in any democracy anywhere in the world when they are planning to build a power station. We haven't now, refused. Now, look, you talk about the... price, I talk about safety. As far as the You've environmental... Let, well, but as far as the environmental... Let's the environmental afterwards. Right. Respond to I'm, health I'm, and safety. I'm afraid that Dan is really just trying to do what he... What he tries to do with on every subject, but it's particularly clear here and helpful for people to see. It's to create fear and to try and scare people instead of trying to be positive about the choices being made. Liquid natural gas is being used to produce electricity throughout Europe. And in the distances involved in Gibraltar are small, but they're not the smallest involved in most countries in Europe. And it's not that we've refused to disclose reports. It's that much of the report work is ongoing. Mm -hmm. And if Danny goes back and looks at Hansard, what we've said is when we have finished all of this work, it will be disclosed. Now, this is not a science where you finish all your reports one day and you start the next to, to build. You are told whether it is possible to do, and then you refine the health and safety work that's going in. Look, Danny must not get away with pretending that he's the only one who cares about health and safety, and we're just looking at pounds, shillings and pence. It is actually possible to combine concern about pounds, shillings and pence and real concern about health and safety. And you know what one of the main issues with health and safety is? Not having the emissions that come from burning diesel. Where it's near the, whether it's near the, the Upper Rock or anywhere near our community, the emissions, the CO2 that, yeah, that I affects think... our lives and can actually cause cancers, etc., which I'm going are to ask greatly question, reduced though, by I, gas. Well, may I, I come can. back on that? Because you, that, that you can, important. but let me ask a very quick question on topic first. They're not going to be exclusively gas. They're going to be dual fired. For a reason. Because if it were necessary at some stage, because we need to be cautious about this, to burn diesel whilst we obtain gas, should there be an opportunity for somebody to stop us from getting gas? We don't think there ever can be because we've always been supplied with diesel uh, by sea and therefore we can always be supplied by, with gas by sea. In the event, in the very unlikely percent, the 0.001% that we might be denied gas, we could burn fuel, uh, which is diesel, okay. and therefore for that period, whilst we re-establish gas supplies, we have to have that protection. We made that decision simply to ensure that nobody could ever hold us to ransom. Mr. Feedham, if I may, I've got one more question, Look, then I'll come to you on that topic. Why not all of them then dual-fired? Well, because we don't think... Because at the moment, only we half don't, of the engines that's are right. gas and we, diesel. We don't think that it is realistic that we will ever be prevented from having gas. But in the event that there might be an opportunity for that to happen, and look, I'm obviously talking about Spain somehow interfering with suppliers or there being a catastrophe, I mean, the safest possible situation in which to be in must be, given that Danny likes to talk about health and safety, and another thing, of course, is security of supply, to be able to burn two types of fuel as effectively and keep the community supplied with electricity. All right. Look. We don't intend to burn any diesel. It would only be an extremist that we would. Mr. Feetham. What he's really saying, there are two points here. What he's really saying is that the government really hasn't, haven't bottomed out the question of health and safety. They haven't carried out the studies. What do you and mean by have, health and safety? Uh, look, the, the, the risks that there are in relation to 
the very peculiar circumstance that we find ourselves here in Gibraltar with lack of space, where this power station is going to be located, on gas, there in the middle of a very densely populated area, and where the government intends to install these liquid natural gas installations. I mean, we feel very uncomfortable about that until we see the raw data, until we see what raw data has made the government take a decision that natural gas is actually safe in those areas for Gibraltar. I mean, I have to say that the jury is still out, but let me also talk about this question of the, uh, the environment. Look, it's a fact that nowadays that you can install state-of-the-art catalytic reduction systems in diesel power stations and you can use environmentally friendly diesel products that can reduce emissions by 85%. Actually, when you compare the CO2 effect on the environment with the, the effect of methane, which is, uh, which is a byproduct of the main byproduct of of, uh, of gas. That's the main contributory factor to global warming across the, across the world. Look, when you, for every cubic meter of liquid natural gas, it requires 600 cubic meters of the gas in liquid form. The extraction of the gas, the, the compression of the gas into that liquid form, the transportation and the storage worldwide actually accounts for more global warming than diesel. And the environmentalists often say, Think global, act local. So it's not the case is not clear cut in terms of the uh, natural gas, gas over and diesel. Our diesel in environmental terms. You've made your point. I'll I mean, give you a quick response. Well, he that. hasn't told us whether if he's elected at the end of next year, he'll cancel the contract simply because we've decided to burn uh, gas. But I think the answer is that he would cancel the contract we've entered into because he wants to uh, think globally and act locally and wants to burn diesel instead of gas. So okay. people well, know that the only way to ensure that they have a, a gas-burning power station in the next 24 well, months is to vote yes, I'll be liberal. You're effectively well, asking the question. Well, so. well, I'll tell you what the answer to that that is, if you, haven't built the power, you if you haven't built the power station by the time the next election comes, and we win, then all the options will be open to the 2A GSD government. And if we feel that actually returning back to our original plans is the best interest of the Gibraltar, that is precisely what we will do. As I say, the jury is still out okay. on, uh, on this question of natural gas. Despite if you were the to be more open, look, if you were, be, well, look, you cancelled at, at a cost of five million pounds mm -hmm. to the taxpayer our contract. So we will have okay. to look at that. Let's leave that point but there. I've got a question for both of you, um, which it, it's obvious why it touches upon both uh, parties, as it were. Uh, when waterport terraces were sold and allocated, uh, the government of Gibraltar, then the GSD, said that the power station would be moved away from that area. But your plans, Mr. Picardo, uh, consist of creating a new power station just several hundred metres away from them. So what would you say to people at Waterport Terraces who are watching tonight? That they do not need to worry about emissions because the emissions will be very tightly controlled and they will involve what Danny described, which are scrubbers, which are also applicable even when you're burning, when you're burning gas. There will be absolutely no emissions to be concerned of. With the burning of gas, there are very few to, to even try and control. There is no diesel knock in these engines when you burn diesel there is a knock in the engine which is what creates most of the noise there is no diesel knock there'll be no shaking there'll be no diesel knock there'll be no noise to speak of in anybody's home and therefore the nuisance associated with being close to a power station in particular one built in the early 1980s will not be there and there'll be no reason for concern and we would not put a power station near people if we thought it would affect their health their safety or their security well, the power station was, as we saw, the most important topic among our uh, respondents to the poll, and we've got a number of questions on those, so I'll go through them um, without having pre-read, I'm afraid, so um, we'll have to see who it's most relevant for. As a South District power station worker, I would like to ask you to put out as much thought in our future employment as you're putting in the urgent need for a new power station, says Headley. And of course we are, because it's very important to us that what we don't do is create uh, issues of unemployment for people who've been working in an industry that's been essential to us uh, for so long. The South District Power Station, whether it's the OESCO Power Station or the MOD Power Station, now known as the GMS Power Station, have been important parts of ensuring the security of electricity supply to our community for many years and the people who've worked there very much in our minds. Okay, Mr. Feetum, a question for you from Lawrence. Um, can you explain the risk that you're talking about in respect of the sighting and the safety of the type of fuel against the risk, says Lawrence, of the 
you know, nuclear submarine visits that we have just half a kilometre away well, from people as well. We don't know what the risks. We don't know what the risks are in terms of any assessment of it because there's been no disclosure on the part of the government of all the material the government has at its disposal that has made the government make this decision to site this power station, which it believes it can be sited safely in that particular location. It would be very easy for Fabian to allay, to assuage my fears and to say, well, look, this is all the material. I am disclosing it to you. This is the reason why we've come to this decision. In any part of the world, as I say, and I, you know, I, I, I'm not an expert, but I've certainly consulted people that are experts, we would have seen uh, uh, blast risk, uh, disclosures of blast re risk reports or, or other types of risk r reports. And therefore, you would have be, we would have been able, and indeed uh, my colleague uh, Jaime Neto has been asking extensively questions about this in Parliament, we would have been able to make that assessment. But the reality is that we do not feel comfortable without seeing that case, which was never made to us when we were in government, of the safety of a gas installation and a gas-fired gas, uh, uh, power station in this area. Look, I also have Can here... I come back just, Mr. Feetum, no, Can very I come quickly, back? Mr. Feetum, very quickly, Mr. Because I'm happy question. to come back on that. We haven't said that we will not give this information. What we've said is that we will give the information when it is completed. And Danny's fears can be or sage or allayed, whichever he prefers, as soon as he can have it. But he can't have it yet because it's not, it's work not ready. in progress. You made that point earlier. Kate asks, um, how is, where is it going to be paid from, the new power station? The new power station is going to be paid from, in fact, it's very easy to pay for the new power station from the capital that we have. The power station is not going to cost £140 million, it's going to cost in the region of £77 million, and the payments will be staged over the next three, uh, three financial years. Well, look, let me take issue with that. Very briefly, because we're going to go to a commercial break. Our power station was going to cost £120 million, but it included... The Jib Telecom, new building for Jib Telecom, uh, all the, uh, the the dual cables you around Gibraltar. You mean Gibraltar? Gibraltar, I beg your pardon. All the dual cables around Gibraltar to upgrade the the replace the the entirety of the network, and also uh, storage facilities in the site. Their power station is 77 million pounds, but it doesn't take into account the gas installation, it doesn't take, it, take into account the £12 million pounds that the government has already spent in the, turb, in the temporary turbines that it's brought over, that it's imported, and it doesn't take into account the £5 million pounds that the government has had to pay for cancelling the previous contract. So all in all, actually, probably, this particular project is going to cost more or less Far exactly the same. It. No, Far it's going to cost more it. or less exactly the same as our project, which was £120 okay. million. You, pounds. you can explain Certainly why not. it's going to be far from it, but let me throw in a question into that. Um, what, do you factor in, when you're saying it's going to cost less, the increased chance of power cuts that will result from the extended period that we are with an older water uh, Absolutely power Absolutely, I do. Absolutely, I do, because, look, as you know, Jonathan, we haven't been operating Waterport Power Station for the past six months. There's only been an engine that's been restarted this month. We have brought in the temporary supply, which we had to bring in, I must remind Danny, very early on after our election. In other words, long before their power station might have been finished, because power cuts started literally the month after we were elected, and we had to bring in temporary supply. They had already brought in a lot of temporary supply, which was costing a bomb because it was rented. It was not all bought, and they bought uh, one megawatt generators, which were tiny. We brought in much larger generators in order to ensure that we don't have any issue whatsoever with the security of supply, with the wattage that we need available in order to provide this community. So that is all completely taken into consideration. But let me tell you more. We started the work on the network immediately. We didn't wait in order to sign this contract. We've been working on the network this immediately. This is the kilometres of cabling that connects everybody's houses. And we've been paying for it year, to year on station. year as we go. And despite that, our economic predictions are still on target. And we'll be able to pay for this power station. We may finance it. And if we do, it'll be an issue which will be public because it'll be an issue that the public need to know about. But it will be possible for us to pay for this power station from the income that this community receives. Their power station, which would have cost us uh, quite a lot more for just the same product was going to be uh, double the cost for the community. And, and the question is why? Why spend double to burn an older fuel well, but, but and look, to incur large fines? I must say it because it's patently, it's patently wrong. Look, it's patently wrong. Our contract for all the things that I've explained was £120 million. 
Now, their contract is 77 million. You've got the cost of the, of the, of the temporary uh, turbines, that's 12 million. If it takes, up to, if it takes it up to 2017, that's probably going to be another 12 million on top of that. Then there is the 5 million of the cost of the cancellation of the contract. And then there is the liquid natural gas installation at the detached mole, that's the preferred site. Now, that, what, what is that going to cost? 20 to 30 million pounds? So it's absurd what for the government to say, to pay for it? it is absurd for the government to say that it's not going to cost what, we, what it cost us, 120 million pounds. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I, what I said to Danny rhetorically is, what makes you think that we have to pay for the gas installation? Oh, it's installation? going to be gifted to the government. No, no, hang on a minute. I, I think that you need to, to think a bit more widely about issues like this, because you know, if, if you pause for thought, one of the issues that is going to be huge in the next 20 to 30 years is gas bunkering. And there are many players who want to get into the gas bunkering market. And you know, Gibraltar is one of the biggest con uh, bunkering ports in the Mediterranean. And there are many people who have an interest in being able to regasify in Gibraltar's port in order to provide gas to ships who will then be powered by gas. And therefore, the government does not discard investing in this regasification plant because it could become a huge source of income for the community, but it is not essential that we should necessarily invest in that uh, but plant because it may be provided okay. to I'm the not, tax. It may be okay. from, and not at all, Danny, because you if, be, you just, you make, if you just let me finish, the no, no, not at all. Gents, if you just let me finish, I must there are insist, entities interested in providing the regasification plant everything at no cost to the taxpayer. Look, everything comes at a price tag. Whether you have to then do something, we'll look at that when the figures are available. I'd like to ask you as Chief Minister uh, one more question. Mr. Feetum suggested that the, your power station wouldn't be ready should you be elected and you go through with it. Um, wouldn't be ready because Dr. Garcia has already uh, conceded, I was going to say confessed, that it won't be ready by the next election. <laughs> When will it be ready? Well, we've said uh, today that we think it will be ready by late 2016, early 2017. I'm quite happy. Danny says that he thinks it won't be ready until 2018. Okay. I'm quite happy to take his That's money. A I bet him a five that okay. it'll be finished That's a in 2017. Answer. Now one for both I'll of take, you. I'll take the bet, There you okay. go. I'll take the bet. Um, and now one for both of you. We can ask Mr. Feetham first. You've both accepted partial responsibility for the power cuts of the past year. Your words to frustrate, not voters, but to frustrated viewers at home who have not been able to, you know, heat up food for their children or whatever it was. Well, look, I'm not in government. Uh, no, but you've accepted think, partial no, no, blame. No, I, I've, just... accepted, I've accepted partial blame in the sense that we could have prioritised this power station instead of, for example, a hospital. If we had done so, we would probably have been criticised for it because some people would have said, no, the priority was the hospital, not the, not, not the, 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 the power station. All I can say to people is that we will act responsibly in the circumstances should we be elected into government next time round. And if we believe that it's in the best interest of Gibraltar not to go back to our plans and to continue with the government plans, we've got to assess how far down the road those are, people can be assured that we will act responsibly. We will not cancel a GSLP project as I believe that they cancelled a GSD project simply because it's a GSD project. That okay, we will you, not do. You've made your point. Mr Picardo, your comments for people at home, as I said, if you would, for people who might be frustrated by the power, power, power cuts, not necessarily people who are thinking about which way they're going to vote. Well, look, I, th I think the position, uh, to be honest, is, is fairly simple. Um, we are sorry if you have suffered a power cut. The reason you suffered a power cut is because we have wanted to make sure that we make the right decision for this generation and future generations and get it at the right price and with the right fuel. And I'm genuinely sorry if you suffer a power cut in the future. It's down to me. It's my fault. I am the one who accepts political responsibility for anything that goes wrong in, my, in this community. And I will do everything to ensure that there are no future power cuts whilst the new power station is being built. Thank you both. We're discussing the results, of course, of a recent GBC poll with the Chief Minister and the Leader of the Opposition. We'll go to your emails and calls in a short while, but first we'll take a, a very short commercial break.